Hi everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining in. I can see we have people from Kilifi, Kakamega, Eldoret and Mombasa, and from everywhere that you are, thank you for taking time to come and be with us and to have this conversation with us. Uh, my name is Naomi, I'm the communication leader at Mchanga, and I'm very excited to have you today as we go through this conversation where we will be exploring online fundraising as a resource mobilization tool for organizations, individuals, and even businesses. And uh, just before I start off, I can just invite my colleague, Michael, who's the lead of sales at Mchanga, to just say to, hi to us and invite us to the session. Michael? Thank you so much, everyone. A warm welcome. And I take this opportunity to invite you for this uh, webinar of today. I'm Michael Lokini, the head of sales. I'll be able to talk more later. And I'll be back to you. And thank you. Yes, thank you. I would just like to introduce to you what Mchanga is briefly before we take the session over to Michael. And uh, Mchanga is an online fundraising platform that provides uh, you with a secure, a convenient, and a, trans and a transparent way to raise funds virtually. And so what we mean by secure is that when you register a fundraiser uh, on Mchanga, you're able to add treasurers and uh, supporting documents just to ensure verification. And so when your donors donate, they are sure that first, what they're donating to is verified. And also uh, you as an organization or an individual and business are able to be assured that your money is going where it goes because treasurers must approve it withdrawals. And also there's the convenience where you register, manage, and even do your withdrawal uh, from the comfort of your device or that's your phone or your laptop. And even if you don't have access to internet, we have USSD options. And also uh, we also offer diversity where you can be able to receive donations from all the mobile money uh, providers available in Kenya and also Uganda and also through Visa and MasterCard and PayPal from anywhere around the world. So now that we have uh, such platforms available to us, it is important for us to have these conversations. And uh, without uh, much, I would like to invite Michael to take us through the session now. And I would like to say thank you for joining and uh, we are excited to learn. So yeah, Michael, welcome. Thank you so much, Naomi. Good afternoon, everyone once more and much and warm welcome. My name, is, my name is Michael Lokini, and I serve at Mchanga as the head of sales. Just let me start by giving this information that this meeting will take one hour, 15 minutes. And I'm also pleased to inform you that we will be having two guest speakers who I will introduce shortly to take us through these sessions. On today's agenda, the fundraising landscapes has changed drastically in the last few years. COVID-19 has equally escalated these changes. Organizations, individuals, and businesses can no longer solely rely on traditional methods of engaging supporters and raising money from the potential donors. Today, it's simply not enough to make phone calls, post emails, or market your events. Instead, nonprofits need to be highly innovative in their approach and activities. By making the best use of the latest digital technology, nonprofits can be way more effective and impactful than before. Whether you are small or big nonprofit or business, online fundraising offers you an opportunity to save thousands, boost your brand awareness, increase the number of donors, and promote your cases all day, every, every day using digital marketing tools and methods. Having a strong digital presence ensures greater impact of your nonprofit activities and put you in a better position to fight for the causes you and your supporters care about. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to explore this critical conversation in details, an opportunity to learn and exchange knowledge on how we can strengthen online fundraising and digital engagement for resource mobilizations. It's therefore my pleasure to introduce to you this rich panel of experts on this topic to share with us more on how organizations, businesses, and even individuals can adopt and leverage on digital avenue including crowdfunding techniques and platforms as a resource mobilization avenues. To kick us off, allow me welcome Sakwa Masai Godfrey, who is specialized in project management, donor management, strategy, government and stakeholder engagement, resource mobilization, 
communication and forging relationships for pursuing organizational growth with both government and non-state actors in the development sector to share with us his thoughts and insights on this. He will be able to introduce himself briefly before making his presentations. Sakwa Karibu Sana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, good afternoon to all our attendees today and to my fellow panelists. As Michael has mentioned, I'm Sako Masai. Uh, my background is in project management and fundraising. I've been able to work with the Mchanga initially and also participated in a, a couple of fundraising initiatives. I've actually raised across uh, different platforms and including Mchanga. And I've also worked in the development sector in the areas of gender, youth, uh, women, empowerment, and education, and currently serve as a KEPSAS SME specialist. Uh, for this particular uh, context today, I'm going to focus more on grant funding, and I look forward to this particular session. I'm also a Yali Fellow and a Rotarian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakwa. So I'll kindly just uh, give you again more time to just take us through the to take us through the presentations with your experience that you've had with the crowdfunding, and kindly just share with us your brief experience on this field. Kindly, over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike. And I know um, I'm assuming today we are not meeting people who are very new into crowdfunding, but the assumption is at least we've been able to interact with this animal or this creature called crowdfunding whereby, as we all know, it's been a new area that has been not been well tapped into. It's arising over the past few years. But one thing that we like to acknowledge is the fact that we are really adopting it well, especially within the East African region. If I may go into some bit of statistics, looking back into 2013, 2016, we'll realize that uh, East Africa was one of the largest uh, consumer or, uh, or uh, where we had the largest uptake of the crowdfunding platforms where we consumed around 38% of the market share, followed by West Africa, and then the other, the North African region. And then coming all the way to the recent times, of course, uh, East Africa has been overtaken or is being overtaken by South Africa and Nigeria, picking up through the West. And this has been caused mostly by the uptake of technology and the enabling of the economy being for people to be able to fundraise or crowdfund uh, mostly. But again, going back to crowdfunding, most of us asked, what is crowdfunding? There is no standard definition of crowdfunding. It's basically being able to come up with an initiative of an, of a, of an initiative or a, or a cause for people to find fundraise or work behind it. And then secondly, develop a platform where we have Mchanga, which is currently uh, the, the premier platform in Kenya. And then thirdly, having people who can come behind you to support you. That is mostly the crowd of people who either understand your product or understand your service. So I would say it is uh, mostly built around the issues of social trust uh, infrastructure. For example, for social trust in Africa, do we really believe uh, uh, crowdfunding as a way forward for us, or do we still believe in Harambe's like we used to do before? On the issue of infrastructure, Kenya is currently leading in the East Africa as one of the best places to crowdfund, one of the best places in terms of having the best technology. So infrastructure also plays a very critical role in terms of being able to understand uh, crowdfunding and being an enabler for all that particular uh, concept. And then thirdly, is also an issue of regulation. Do we have the concept of regulation uh, being undertaken seriously? Because again, we have money being involved. We have issues of transparency. We have issues of accountability. So the moment we have those three, accountability or uh, regulation, infrastructure, and uh, social trust, it really builds into how we can really understand the, the dynamics of uh, crowdfunding. And last but most least is also to appreciate the fact that it is growing slowly. Uh, if you look at the rise of the middle class economies, uh, despite the pandemic that we have currently, and then we have uh, the diaspora remittances, which are really increasing over time. And most importantly, the acceptance of the model. It's really slowly becoming accepted over time. If you look, for example, if you go to the platform of uh, Mchanga, you find over time the numbers have gone. And it's something that we're really appreciating over time. So that is my opening remark. Uh, I don't want to go into details at this particular time, but I will allow to go back to Michael and then I can go into the presentation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakwa, for that. I'm really happy that you've touched on the diaspora remittance. And I can confirm that this is something that is really growing. And also the crowdfunding is growing more so in East Africa. 
We are having organizations, individuals, and businesses who are setting up an account daily, and they are able to attend their fundraising needs by the use of crowdfunding. And uh, that's really working them for, 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 for them. So I also want to acknowledge that our second speaker I've joined, that's Mike Mushilwa. Mike, I, I'll, Mike, you'll just say hi to us, as I'll be able to give you the time to present later. Just say hi, Mike, kindly. OK. OK. Hi, let me see whether. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Michelua. I'm the former chair of the Kenya Association of Fundraising Professionals. I'm an author of five books and a contributing author to four others. I'm passionate about fundraising. I've been in this space for the last three decades or so, uh, 30 years to be exact, and I'll be happy to be speaking to you on crowdfunding today. Thank you so much for that, Mike. So I'll just take you back to Sakwa. Sakwa, kindly, will you just give us a brief description so now organizations, individuals, and business can adopt and leverage on, on, on online crowdfunding, on crowdfunding techniques and platforms as a resource mobilizations, kindly with your experience. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. I'll, uh, I'll just uh, say, first of all, um, uh, crowdfunding, for example, when you talk to an organization, it has mostly been assumed to be an area whereby we are only focusing to ask for money whenever we are in problem or in trouble. But we've never looked at it and tapped it into it as a resource that we can use as an organization to raise more uh, capabilities or uh, resources for organizations. So maybe one of the things that I can just talk around is uh, why companies should go towards that particular approach. We look at uh, the crowd of the tribe that works within a brand. It is one of the reasons why a company can go into crowdfunding because crowdfunding after all, it's one of the easiest way to fundraise. In fact, uh, if you look at the issues of safety and uh, transparency, if you look at an issue of efficiency, like right now we are really locked down uh, by the COVID-19. How am I going to raise money to another county, for example, and not to go there? Within crowdfunding, it allows you, it plays with the space of technology. It plays with, with within where we are safe, where we are comfortable. I start with my own group, and then I expand all over time to reach to other people within my network. So crowdfunding is, a, is, a, is, a, is an enabler both for for-profit and non-profit organization, whereby for non-profit, it can help them cover the gaps where they're having challenges in fundraising. Whereas when it comes to the organization that is in profit, can you look at maybe increasing equity or uh, finding debt for the company for it to grow, expand, or even just in terms of business operations? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakwa. And before I take us to the next speaker, that's Mike Mushila, I'll just give this opportunity for one burning question in case you are having a, a question based on what Sakwa has presented and you really want us to tackle that before we move on. Kindly just raise your hands so that Naomi can be able to get, get that kindly. Just one burning question as we move to, as we move to the second speaker. In case there is, there is any, kindly just raise your hands. Thank you. Okay, so we have Wilson. Uh, I'll allow him to speak. Uh, Wilson, go ahead. Wilson, kind of mute and ask a question. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Yes, I was asking that um, crowdfunding is a technology that is first taking shape in Kenya. But going by maybe cyber threats like uh, hacking, do you think it can uh, face such dangers? Because as an, as an IT professional, we, we, we tend to also look at those sides, the sides of security, cyber threats, and other things. Does it face any such threats? Mm, That's uh, my question. OK, thank you for the question. I can see yes. Mike smiling. Uh, probably <laughs> could answer the question. <laughs> yeah, there is no sector that is technologically driven that does not have threats. There'll always be threats. The question is uh, the measures that are put in place to li uh, limit or minimize the the incidences yes. of people then to to break into your your accounts and uh, take off their money. But uh, looking at M Chang and other. Uh, platforms that we have. There are a lot of security uh, measures that are put in place. And if you look at the people then, okay. because Anger is not registered with the Communications Authority of Kenya as 
a telephone operator is you'll use the pay bill that gets your thing to the MChang account. Again, the Safari comms and so on uh, are well protected. They keep on, in fact, they pay hackers to keep on breaking into their system yes. to see <laughs> what weaknesses are. But it's just to say, because it's a, an increasing threat, especially during these COVID times, that you work with the necessary professionals to always ensure that that risk yeah, is managed. It'll never be zero, that's the truth. But it's just to keep it limited. But again, building on what Sark was said, yeah, is crowdfunding is actually Harambe online. We call it Harambe online because traditionally yes. as the people of Africa, we've always come together to help each other. Yeah, whether it's for education, whether it's uh, weddings, so you want to be a Harambe wife or husband, whether it yeah. is health, especially these times of COVID, yeah, is we've always helped it to build, to, to build the, the schools and hospitals that were built during the Harambe system. We've always done that. Yeah, but as the so-called Silicon Savannah, we are saying yeah. then uh, 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 in, uh, applications like uh, M Changa give us the opportunity to be able to contribute something without having to step into a room at KICC and be told sure. all those with blue shirts stand up and give money. Yes. For those other guys, I can give money from the safety yes. of my home, my car, wherever I am. Yeah, so it's something we are doing. And I'll end by saying, if you look at WhatsApp, there's a lot of harambees on WhatsApp these days. Yeah, of course they are, they are concerned, but we raise money all the time. You're always giving, a friend has lost a dad or there's someone who's sick, we're always giving money. Yeah, so it's nothing to fear. We need to be careful about the risk, but it's nothing to fear, it's the future. Okay, thank okay, you. okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for that. I was, I will give it one question. That's a burning question for that. And thank you for, you've tackled it well. I just want to go back to Sakwa to take us few minutes of the presentations on the, this topic that we are discussing. And Sakwa, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Let me just jump through the technical bit of the presentation so that we can also reduce the questions so that when uh, Mike and I come back, it will be easy for us to continue. So I think we are good to go. Am I? Is my screen able to, you are seeing my screen now? Yes, we are. You're able to see the screen? Yes. Okay, so I will just start and take you through the presentation. And sorry if I go uh, through it very fast, feel free to stop me and ask me to go back. So what we just want to do is understand uh, what is uh, this animal, we call it crowdfunding. And uh, we'll take you through a few tidbits here and there. So for crowdfunding first is, um, Sorry, technology is really pulling me back. Okay, I'll just go through this particular screen. So for us to understand what crowdfunding is, uh, one is uh, we have a project initiator. For example, if I come up with an in initiative, that's who becomes the project initiator. And then we have a crowdfunding platform whereby that is particularly, for example, Mchanga, the Kickstarters, the Indiegogos who come on board to support a campaign. And then now the most critical part is now the crowd. The crowd can be your friends, can be family, can be your colleagues, can be people who support you or your initiative. And then just for us to understand and uh, go uh, deeper into crowdfunding, I know we've mostly understood crowdfunding to be donation-based whereby we are giving to support a particular cause or initiative. But if you want to understand crowdfunding better, we go to the four models of types of fund crowdfunding that are there currently. One is the donation-based whereby we give to support, for example, for charitable causes, or we give without expecting any money to come back. This has been the most uh, traditional way of giving and uh, that's what we know mostly. We give either to support for good, we give either to support for a problem that is being faced or to promote the community well-being. And that's what is mostly used by the nonprofits. And then going to the second bit, which is now rewards based, whereby it's more similar towards the donation base, but however, there is some bit of rewarding whereby, for example, if I'm launching a music album or if I'm selling shoes, and for those who have been here, you know, a, a company like Ender Sport, which is designing uh, sportswear. If, for example, I'm designing, um, I will say, biodegradable pens that they are currently existing to save on the environment. So if I donate any amount above a thousand shillings, I'm able to buy a packet or a box of pens for 10% discount. If I donate above 5,000, 5, I'm able to get, let's say, 15% discount. So this is the kind of reward funding that we're talking about. And then there is the debt base. So for those who are here today and they are in business or investment or the venture capitalism or that language you understand is whereby people will come to support you 
But at the end of the day, the money must be given back once it gains interest, once the profit starts to pick up. So that's another interesting bit of crowdfunding for those who did not know whereby it's not only for charitable courses, but again, uh, people in enterprise can also venture into crowdfunding. And then the, the last and the fourth one is around equity based, whereby instead of people they, uh, be giving you money expecting to get their money back, it's a crowd of people who will come and then they'll eventually take portions and pieces of your company or a business, whereby it's equivalent to buying equity into your business. So when you're talking about crowdfunding, those are the typical types of crowdfunding. So whenever you sit as an organization, you always try to assess where do I fit, where do I fall into. If I'm running a campaign for, to help a charitable uh, project, for example, in an organization, how do I work through that? If I'm coming up with a social enterprise, which is now where mo most NGOs are going there, and I know Mike will touch on that in the conversation, where do I put my company or organization? And then just to understand so the history of uh, crowdfunding, most of the platform came around 2002, as when we began to do crowdfunding mostly. And then in 2005, we came into social lending. Around 2007, that's where platform become, became conscious of the fact of rewarding. People are just giving me, but what do I give back? How, do I, how, am, I able, how am I able to complement their efforts towards supporting me? And currently, as we look into the future of crowdfunding, you're talking about $96 billion, not only in Kenya, not in Africa, but all over the world. So the question that we should ask ourselves at this particular point is, uh, are we able, for example, to tap into this particular market? This is $95, $96 billion. Can my company get a 0.01 or 2% of that particular uh, portion of the market? And then uh, just to understand what really determines the success of a fundraising or crowdfunding campaign is one, the size of your network. That's why we always say, whenever you start a campaign, always try to improve your network, build it, test it before going public, and then understand it. And then number two is also around the ability to give. As an example is currently like right now, we are going through a pandemic. We have been really been reduced to uh, just spare or spend what we can barely survive with. So what is my ability if I was to give a thousand shillings in 2019, December, then I could give 800 in 2020, December. What is the prospect of you setting up a campaign in 2021 and asking me for a thousand shillings? Those are very critical questions we need to have. And then number three is the willingness to give. Am I able to give money? Do I want to give? Do I want to support that particular campaign? Is your target audience willing to come up and really go in, into supporting you? And then uh, last, and then just as I wind up, uh, but I don't want to take most of the time on slides, is uh, when you're doing a campaign, these are the most critical areas to consider. One is uh, the project needs, understand properly what are the needs of the campaign. I will, uh, we shall discuss this later, but for example, you're running up a farm and you need 1 million, but you're asking for half a million. Where is the other half a million coming from? And in case you get an over subscription and you raise more money, how will you cope with that? And then how much time do you need? For example, your campaign um, is to be done in June and you start planning now because you've just had this particular session. Is, there, is that going to be successful? And then number three, what is the budget for attracting the funds? Uh, we don't do a account fund from zero. Chances are very low. Unless you are getting people who will give you their time because even time is money. So you should always budget also to fundraise always budget to raise more money. It's not only you asking for people, but you should also have either in kind, in cash or skills with people who are going to support you. And then uh, understand who will be set to support you, who are the people can come on board to work with you. And then mostly understand your target audience. That is why we say understand or even segment people who you're going to borrow from. Who are you going to ask for 10 shilling? Who are you going to ask for a million? Who are you going to ask for a thousand? Who's going to do that particular job? And then most importantly, what makes your project outstanding? If we have 10 projects here, what will, it, what will it make it so that I can give you instead of giving the other campaign? So with that, I just want to end by one quote, which says, before you even start building your crowdfunding page, start by building your what? Your crowd. Thank you so much. And I hand over back to you, Mike. Thank you so much, Takwa, for that insightful. Uh, you've really tackled it well, and I like the, the types of crowdfunding that you've mentioned, donor-based, reward-based, debt-based, and equity-based. So whenever you are start, you are thinking of doing a crowdfunding, you need at least to know which one does your category <coughs> fall in. Up to this point, I'll just have to in, in, introduce Mike Mushilwa, from the, who works from the Kenya Association of Fundraising Professionals, to also kindly take us through his presentations on this topic. Mike, kindly over to you, and welcome. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm going to try share my screen. 
Yeah, let me try and uh, share my screen, then uh, pick up on where, let's see. Yeah, of course, uh, uh, Sakwa has given us a very good overview of crowdfunding and I hope to be able to build on that. Okay, try, let me see. Give me a minute. Sako, I seem to be having the same issues you had before. <laughs> okay, it's refusing to pick. So let me try it again one more time. So I think while we talk about that, uh, one of the things that I'll want to do is then pick it up from a local perspective. Yeah, building on uh, what Sakwa said, but being able then to do it with a, a in a very simple manner. I don't know that you can see my screen, not yet. Is it showing? No, it's giving not me an yet. error. Not yet. I don't know why it's not picking. Yeah, but let me try it again. And maybe while I do that, you can pick a, a question from the participants, Michael. So we, now we can take okay. that question. Sure. Uh, we actually have a question here uh, in regard to what uh, Sako had been speaking about. And so some uh, Beverly asks, what is an estimate timeline for different project sizes? For example, if I start with a pilot or a prototype, what is the actual scale of time from building a network to successfully setting up a crowdfunding campaign? And so uh, this question just tackles around uh, how long in, in, in your experience is it, what time is sufficient from the time you start the process to when you now actually start your fundraising? Thank you for that question. Uh, to be honest, the campaign can take you anything between three to five months. And uh, three to five months is not the time that you're fully raising the money. I'm assuming there is a month, uh, there is one month for planning or even two, just basically understanding and setting up the campaign. There are more things into the campaign. There is the issue of communication, planning a team behind you, working with the crowd that will come to support you, looking at your resources and your network. And then there is a phase in between where you communicate to the public, you go public, where you do a soft lunch, for example, test with your people, come back again, that's what you call the prototyping bit, and then you go fully public. So you'll find maybe you'll have two months before running a campaign. Then you have one to one and a half months of uh, actively engaging your audience, and then another month of just ending, where there is a thank you bit, there is a bit of accountability. Because again, uh, looking into the conversation further, there's a bit where you say thank you to the people I've given you. Whether you've reached your target or not, there's a bit of saying thank you, because we've said about a target, there is a bit of a lot of engagement. So in a nutshell, I'll say it's a full-time job that will run in between anything, anything between three to six months, including both planning, execution, and then assessment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sakwa. And also just to add, I just want to say that it's also depends with the type of activity that you want to do. For example, you are an organization and there, there is an emergency response somewhere. There's a flood and you want to respond to this. So you'll not, it, you, 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 you'll not have that much time to organize all that. So it just depends with the type of the fundraising or the, 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 the activity that you want to do at that specific time. And also just, but there's not that standard time that you have to take all this duration for you to go to the actual fundraising. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Now me back to you in case there's any other. Mike, are you ready? Uh, maybe we can ask one more as uh, Mike uh, yeah. continues. And so someone uh, is asked, uh, yeah? Yeah, one more. Yeah, I'll just send it to you because it's giving me yeah, it's giving me an error message. So I'll just email it to you, Michael, then you can pick it up from that side, yeah? So as you answer the question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have Moses asking, uh, as we as Kenyans and Africans embracing crowdfunding, and uh, even as we do this, uh, because of how different it is with Harambe, are we actually ready for this change? And I think uh, at, at first, Sakwa gave some uh, information with data, to back this up, but I think you can just uh, answer that so that the people who joined it later can also uh, get to hear about how crowdfunding has been embraced in Africa and Kenya. Sakwa, can you. you Yeah, so I will say 
Africa is really embracing it. There is no room. Change is inevitable, I would say that word. And as I said earlier, for maybe those who joined us much a bit later, looking in between 2013 to 2016, East Africa took 38% of the market share in terms of crowdfunding, followed by West Africa, where it's 34%, and then South Africa, Central, and then North. But as you look into time uh, beyond 2017, you'll realize Nigeria, that is the West Africa, and South Africa is becoming a top leader in terms of crowdfunding. Actually, if you give you an example of South Africa, they have really embraced the idea of crowdfunding for businesses, where they go into reward funding, they go into enterprise crowdfunding, where people are coming up with concepts around uh, a particular goal, maybe it's the SDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, the African Vision 2063, all those kind of approaches where people are coming up and they're saying, this is what we want to support. So the, the shift is actually happening. And Mike has actually been very instrumental into what we can we call the East African Philanthropy Network. There's actually a network between Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and the East African countries where they're really developing models, bringing on board corporate partners, bringing on board technical partners like the Khan Foundation, who are working to critically empower organizations to understand crowdfunding. And I know even some of the audiences here, some of the point audience have already been part of that particular process where I've been taken through the training, understand how to roll out a campaign, the critical bits around how, what it needs to go forward. So there is goodwill currently, there is regulation actually. For example, I know for Mchanga, if I'm not wrong, Mike, Central Bank knows you exist and they really monitor your processes if I'm not wrong, right? So there is room, there is the goodwill, there is regulation. And of course with infrastructure through technology, it's a, there is the real time actually to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We'll not take another question. Mike will share that on our email. I will be able to share the presentations uh, for everyone after this. So Mike, kindly, you can go through. You can just have your presentation without sharing the screen. OK, so I'm also sending it to you. So once you get it, then you'll be able then to share it with everyone, because I think then uh, it will add some value. But I wanted them to pick up on the issue. I think once you get it, then you'll share it with me, but I've just sent it to you. But I'd wanted to simplify things because sometimes this thing gets very complicated for, for nothing. And people tend to think that uh, it's rocket science to be able to run a campaign yeah, on uh, uh, social media. But I want to pick up on two of them. One is the one of uh, Jadudi, which many of you know, uh, it was a campaign that was run about three, four years ago. Unfortunately, we lost Jadudi about a year ago to, to cancer. But uh, one reason I like the Jadudi campaign is because it, it was a very simple campaign, uh, uh, virtually conceived of a day, yeah, needed to raise a particular amount of money over two days, yeah, in order to, to be able to get Jadudi treatment in India. And it raised a significant amount, actually 7.4 million. Uh, shillings over four days. I don't know whether Mike, you've got the presentation. So the not interesting yet. thing with, you got it? Yeah, not yet, but you can just send it. Yeah, That's I've cool. already sent it. So one of the interesting things with Jadudi's campaign again, was it was typically low cost. Eh? Low cost in that uh, many people tend to complain that they don't have a budget. But when you look at Jadudi's campaign, is they, they didn't have a budget set aside to say we have 1 million shillings, 200,000 shillings or anything else to run a campaign. They just got down to it. Uh, an appeal came from uh, uh, Jadudi, initially directly to Biko Zulu, who was the, uh, the main person behind it. Yeah, and, and then went through Zawadi Nyongo and they were looking for, for help to be, uh, to be able to raise. The target was actually 1 million shillings over a short period of time, over two days, to enable Jadudi take his fourth yeah, cancer operation. Uh, many of you will know Zawadi Nyongo again, who is a, a tech whiz, uh, has a lot of experience in social media uh, fundraising and related issues. Yeah, some of you might know Biko Zulu again, uh, uh, called Jackson Biko, who writes for the nation, is a very good storyteller, but uh, uh, doesn't like publicity that much. Yeah, and uh, typically what happened, I think if uh, I go through the steps, is uh, uh, Jadudi had uh, actually approached Biko, yeah, uh, a year uh, in advance where he had been, uh, they, they had been communicating through the direct mail uh, aspect of Twitter. And uh, Jadudi that time was mourning, I mean, uh, 
the Biko that time was mourning his mom. So essentially he had just come from a memorial. So he didn't want to talk too much. And the, the story ended there. But a few months later, Jadudi was in critical condition and again approached Biko, but also approached Zawadi. And Zawadi then talked to Biko and said, look, yeah, it's Wednesday. We need to raise a million shillings by Saturday. Can you come in and help? And Jadudi thought about it and said, okay, fine. I'll see what I can do. So Biko then spent quite a bit of time talking to Jadudi and wrote an article that actually touched a lot of hearts. Yeah, but it didn't stop there is Jadudi's friend then picked up that story that Biko put together and it was called that thing in, uh, uh, in, in, in my head. If they picked it up and he had 15 of his friends in the University of Nairobi who spent the night actually tweeting yeah, uh, this particular campaign or this fund, uh, fundraising campaign until it went uh, viral. And they were actually then using a lot of the mobile yeah, platforms to be able to get things out. But that story was so seductive that uh, it touched people's hearts. And if I pick up some of the, the things that came through, I mean, first from, uh, from Biko's side, yeah, is when Biko was asked about it, he said, I love stories that seduce my emotions, stories that you write in your own heart before they become alive on paper. Before I sat down to write this uh, story, one thing was clear. People needed to feel connected to this boy and his tribulations in a way they could empathize with his plight. But he goes on to say, as a motivation for writing this story, is they needed to walk a mile in his shoes. To use an embarrassing cliche, the story had to come alive. It had to come with smells. And so we had numerous phone conversations from which I took the details of his history. How did it all start? The headaches. How did you find out? What day was it? What specifics of the day can you recall? How was the weather like? Describe the radiologist. And I remember talking to Biko about it. And he said, look, uh, Jadudi was already uh, having problems. I mean, he would get dizzy and so on. So the, the, the phone calls couldn't go beyond 10 minutes. But he had to get into his shoes, begin to feel his plight, begin to see how his mom reacted, how his friends reacted before he could write that story that actually was at the heart of this campaign. And uh, he goes on to say, this line of questioning for small details basically made me feel get him asking that story. Offer that three dimension that gave it texture. Chexa offered structure. Readers needed to feel the coarseness of his story. No one ever gave money if they didn't trust them. They trusted Jadudi and I wanted to believe they trusted me. My job ideally ended when I posted that story. If no one connected to it, it would have failed and I would have failed Jadudi. Yeah, I would have misrepresented his struggle and his plea. So, he, again, talking to him, he, he, he talks about just telling a story. I just told the st touching story of a boy battling cancer and someone shared it to many people on Twitter and God did the rest. So I'm emphasizing a lot on storytelling because if you take out Jadudi's, uh, uh, the, the story Biko wrote for Jadudi on this thing, then there's no campaign. Storytelling was at the heart of this campaign and at the heart of many other campaigns. So if you look at the success trajectory, they posted the story on the morning of 4th August, yeah? By 4.12 uh, p.m., five hours later, they had raised one million. By 5 p.m., yeah, and uh, 5th August, 4.08 p.m., about 24 hours later, it was five million. 6th August, 48 hours later, it was 6.5 million. Eventually, it was 7.4 million, and they had to tell people to stop giving. But again, if you look at the monies that came in, anything from 100 shillings, so 200, 500, 1,000, people gave what they could. And as the uh, main media picked it up, uh, companies like Sarova Pan Africa came in to provide accommodation. Kenya Airways then agreed to fly him to India. NHIF that had refused to support him right from the beginning joined the free and agreed to pay. So I, when you talk to Zawadi, and Zawadi again uh, is a very interesting, passionate person when it comes to social media, she says, we were aiming for 1 million and the response was amazing. People would send as little as 10 shillings and we ended up with 7.2 million. And we even had to ask people to stop sending their contributions. I mean, when have you ever asked people to stop sending money? But this story then uh, brings up several other issues because again, in Jadudi's own words, yeah, is the emotion that came from it. It did not only just get uh, donations from Kenya, but you had people from Sweden, from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, from the US giving money, yeah? 
uh, people sending him information is in, in his inbox wanting to help. Yeah, people, strangers who are praying for Jadudi to get well. Yeah, people who are tweeting Bible verses. Yeah, no one was uh, uh, criticizing the thing. But virtually then uh, many ladies, so I don't know why it was ladies, yeah, but many ladies again tweeted and said the story made them cry. But there are other things that we, 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 we can ask and also learn from this campaign. Yeah, they are the, what I call the what ifs. Yeah, what if uh, Biko Zulu had not written this story with so much passion? Yeah, how much money would this campaign have raised? Again, Jadudi was going through his fourth uh, surgery and would ask, what if it was the first surgery? Would people have been as generous as they were because it was the fourth? Yeah, uh, Jadudi was not his real name. Yeah, his real name was Otieno. And we asked then, what if we used Otieno instead of Jadudi in a, in a very tribally polarized country, especially towards elections? Would people have supported Otieno as much as they supported Odu, uh, Jadudi? He was a campus student that time. What if you were looking at someone who was 50, 60 years old? Would that generosity have been there? Yeah. His family had sold everything, land, livestock, to be able to support him. What if he didn't come from a, a poor background? Yeah. What if it was not cancer? What if it was HIV AIDS? Would they have been uh, as generous? What if uh, the Africa Cancer Foundation had not come in? So there'll always be questions you ask in any crowdfunding campaign that will influence. And what we are, we, are, we are talking about here is we are saying we really need to think about yeah, the campaign and designing, not just the storytelling, but you need to look out and say then, how is the targeted audience going to react to the kind of messaging and platforms that we are putting up? Yeah, there were some downsides. One, of course, was communication. They didn't communicate as much. And one thing that really backfired on this campaign that uh, hurt it is when people found out NHIF was footing the bill in India. Of course, initially they had refused, but once this campaign went viral and mainstream media, the citizens, NTVs, KTNs picked it up, yeah, NHIF agreed to come in and pay the whole bill. But this was not communicated in time and it ended up being one of the, the bad sides of the campaign. But there are many learning points from this thing. One is we are in the age of uh, disruption. And coming back to what uh, my colleague Sakwa had said earlier on, yeah, is digital fundraising, crowdfunding, online fundraising is the future. So the M Changas are here to stay. It gives you, like you see in Jadudi's campaign, uh, the ability to tap both local and international sources. And when I, I talk about Dugunyoro, you'll also see that connection. Uh, again, Sakwa talked about the crowd. Yeah, crowdfunding is about the crowd. It's about the mob. If you don't have the mob, yeah, if you don't have a crowd around it, then your campaign is not going to gel. In this particular thing, it was able then to leverage on the tweeting and retweeting that uh, Jadudi's friends did, but also on the good name and networks that both uh, Biko Zulu and Zawadi Nyongo had. That really came in to help. Essentially, again, you're saying we are fundraising online. But very importantly is we don't need large budgets. Because whenever you're talking to people you say you don't have a budget, this thing had no budget. The do this campaign had zero budget. Yeah, but you had two people who came in and said, let us help this young man. Yeah, and the rest again is history. It's one of the most successful short-term campaigns we, we, we've seen in, in history within the, the, the region. Again, it brought up the power of social media as a resource mobilization too. Yeah, so whether you're looking at uh, things like WhatsApp, again, that has become an interesting fundraising uh, 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 pl uh, mobilization platform. So people are mobilized through that and give through other means like Mchanga. Whether you're looking at Facebook Live that people like Ndugunyoro use is social media can be a powerful way of getting a message out cost effectively. The right people, yeah, so the right storyteller was Biko Zulu. Yeah, the, the right person to help organize a, the, the, the social media itself, again, was uh, Zawadi Nyongo. So getting the right team to push it is critical. Communicating effectively with your audience. Again, storytelling, I don't need to say more. Accountability and transparency, this came to heart the campaign because even as other people came in like NHIF, they did not tell people. So yes, it was successful. Yeah, but people felt cheated that they were not told the full story. Lastly, it proves, and it, just like we all know, Kenyans are generous and want to help. I'll say uh, another few words about uh, another uh, gentleman, Dugunyoro, again, a friend of mine, who runs Affecto Foundation. And Dugunyoro, for many years, actually ran campaigns using his own name until 
his large following of 200,000 uh, 200, followers now on Facebook actually forced him to start a factor foundation two years ago. Interestingly, Ndugunyoro relies on M. Changa for all his back operations. So all the money comes through M. Changa, you can see who has given what, and if he ever needs to reverse payments, give it back to the donor, M. Changa does it to him, for him. So Ndugunyoro for a long time, until two years ago, was uh, five volunteers, they would not take any money for overheads. All the money was going in to support the work that was being done because they had M. Changa looking at his back. I've, I've had the opportunity to be in sessions with, M, uh, with Ndugunyoro where he comes to talk to people we have and introduce him to some of his own members because there are 200,000 members. He's never met nearly all of them. And very of, a few of them have met him. So when you bring the two together, they get very excited. They want to sit down, have breakfast. But these people are very, very generous. And uh, Ndugunyoro is the kind of guy who can raise two to nine million shillings yeah, over a week or two weeks for a campaign for something that they believe in. Yeah, he's someone with the capacity to raise a million dollars out there, yeah, through his uh, crowd when there's something that needs to be helped. They're very loyal, yeah? They're, and it ranges from people who give $1, 100 shillings, to people who give thousands of shillings towards the cause. But these people believe the work that Dugunyoro now affect our foundation is doing, being able to improve lives, yeah? It means that even with my 200 shillings, $2, I can make a difference. I can change a life. I can save a life, yeah? Where, yeah, uh, in, in cases where I would not have been able to do so alone. He capitalizes, Nugunyoro talks a lot about Facebook Live, meaning that he's able then to make his partners, yeah, his members part of it. So it's not about going, give me money to do. He's turned that community into a whole group of people who, that works together makes decisions together to be able to fix the challenges out there. Yeah, and since the money is all dedicated to the good work they do, he, he continues then to maintain that good faith. On Friday, he gives them an opportunity to trade with each other because it has all the people out there. So he also looks at his crowd. And to end, because of time, just to say, when you look at Dugunyoro, Dugunyoro does not have a budget to fundraise. He's a volunteer and he, he does his own business to look after himself but he has touched many lives in health, in education. He's done a lot of great stuff out there and his stories continue. He doesn't have a budget, but he has the right tools. Yeah, he has M. Changa looking after him on one side and Facebook and now Facebook Live on the other side. I'll end by saying, yeah, and if uh, Michael gives me two minutes to finish, is yes, we can think about uh, fundraising online or Harambe line as being difficult, but look at the situations we've seen in the last one year or so. Yeah, someone posts something about a woman uh, cooking stones in, I think, is it Cliffy or Kwale? Yeah, and out of it, then Kenyans are touched and a pay bill comes up, yeah, or an Mchanga thing comes up, and people give money towards this particular cause. Yeah, uh, other people then walk in and even bring her shopping, amongst other things. Eventually, she's even built for a house because of the power of social media. A guy stands out of his house during the COVID period and says, Look, I've been thrown out by the landlord because I've not paid rent. What happens, yeah, is again, uh, people send money and within uh, two days, this guy has 300,000 shillings, again, sent in by the crowd. That was touched by his plight, yeah? So we are saying then, Kenyans are generous. If there's a good story going there, and especially again, if it touches social media, main media, you'll be able to raise the money that is out there. So let me end there, Michael, in the interest of time. And thanks for the opportunity. I think you'll just take the opportunity to email the presentation to everyone then. Who... Sure, I I'll be able to do that. After this, we'll be able to send it on the email. And Mike, thank you so much for that presentation. From, the, from Just to at least to point out some from the story, when you are planning to do a, a, a crowdfunding, come up with a appealing story that has come from the story of Jadudi, then you have to be factual in your story. You don't need to exaggerate. Or, do, or just be factual. You also, during that time, be plan for the target audience. Who are you going to target? And you've also seen that there's power of using social media to reach your target audience, and then the accountability and transparency. Thank you so much for that. And maybe you are in this session and you've never, you, you've not, it's the first time you are coming across the name M. Changa. 
We are a fundraising platform that even if, when you set up an account with us, the platform allow you to put a story, you can be able to upload a photo, you can be able to put a video, that when you share with people online, they are able to read this story without you explaining to them orally. Thank you so much for that, Naomi. I'll just quickly take you, uh, take it back to you and check, kindly check the questions which are there so that we can be able to address to them in the interest of time. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, thank you, Michael. We actually have so many questions in 15 minutes and a lot of raised hands. So we'll just try and uh, answer as many as we can with the time we have. And then just in case your question is not answered, we can be able to do that uh, on email after the session. And so uh, first, someone has, uh, Harun has asked, uh, what, are some, what are some of the good concepts for data-driven fundraising? So this is best practices, best experience, and any lessons. So I think Mike and Sakwa can maybe answer this briefly. Uh, from your experience so far, uh, what are some of the good concepts for data-driven fundraising? Uh, uh, Mike, can you go or I go first? Sakwa, I guess go, go first, first Sakwa. So for data-driven, I would say it really works more towards the entrepreneurs in that they really they have taken a more scientific approach into crowdfunding. And I would say uh, in terms of the best practice, you look at, for example, like what Mike has mentioned, uh, the crowd they have reached to, keep, to give, and also most importantly, the timing. Like timing is very critical. You can run a campaign for seven months that it never works, and you can run a campaign for a few weeks and it works. Actually, for myself, when we raised $2 million using Mchanga, we began a campaign for seven months, but it actually worked within the last month where we actually put everything into practice. So when it comes into data, we've really not as a market gone into such a perspective, but in South Africa and Europe, that is really working for them. Of course, they're looking at, they're putting into so many metrics. For example, they go into Facebook, they're looking at the traffic that is going towards their page. They're looking at the social media handles, how much uh, traffic they're getting there. What are they, like it goes deeper into informatics as opposed to the, the to the organic crowdfunding which we are doing currently in Kenya but however the practices remain the same is it uh, is it the ability to give the, 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 the timing that you are doing the size of the crowd that you're going towards because one of the things that I would say for example Harun um, you might come up with all this data but as Mike has said the most critical thing is the execution you can have the data you can have everything right even the best practices but how do you execute it? How do you come up with your story? Is it compelling? Does it have a trajectory? Is there a, point, a turning point whereby, like we always say, every movie has a hero. Is there a hero at the end of the story that I'm seeing when I'm, when I'm looking into a crowd campaign? So once you look into all those critical parts, then it forms what you call a melting pot of the best campaign practice. But again, every, every campaign is so different. The way you run a medical campaign is not the way someone will run a wedding campaign or someone will run a campaign to raise money, for example, in terms of capital for a business. Okay, so maybe if I comment also, and th thanks Sakwa for, for saying that. Uh, when you get to the West and you're looking at, especially at the, the big INGUs, is a lot of them are data driven. So even when you're looking at the target group, they'll want to look at the target group and look at age. Yeah, are they young? Are we targeting old people? Are they women? Yeah, are they men? Yeah, are they in any what classes? Yeah, so are we dealing with middle class? the rich and the poor, all these questions come into play. And by the way, the, the rich guys don't uh, give much. Eh? Yeah, even though we are used to seeing an occasional, the, the, the people who've really been generous, like James Mwangi, who gave 300 million from his family itself, eh? forget what equity and the rest gave. By the time they were through, it was 1.5 billion, him and his partners. Eh? Because those people are a few. Yeah, the, the rich guys are the ones who will force you to buy them a beer or a drink in the Iga club. Eh? It's the middle class, the lower classes that give. But when you look at data-driven, then you want to understand your target group. Yeah, you want to understand when they are likely to look at your social media post. Is it in the, uh, in the evening? Is it in the morning? Yeah, is the weekend a good time? So you're getting down into a lot of specifics that can complicate things quite a bit. But I say, if you're pushing this thing, let us start off from simple. and. One aspect to note is we are all fundraisers. Naturally, as Africans, we are fundraisers. We've buried, uh, buried a loved one. We've had to raise money to get, send a child to school. Yeah, we've had to deal with health issues. Yeah, because we are communal. Only that we don't see ourselves as donors. And the mistake we make is when we walk into organizations, 
whether physically or virtually, we forget. Yeah, so I'll say I don't know anything about fundraising. Then in the evening, I have a committee trying to raise money for my wedding. It's fundraising, the techniques are the same. Yeah, Africans, especially Africans are emotional. So if you can make that emotional connection, you are on it and it's the story that sells. They look at it, does the story make sense and they're able to ride on it. So I say, start off simply, yeah? Avoid all these paradigms that, that, that are not us. No, we, we are generous. Start off from a simple campaign to, to raise money, let's say to support this uh, orphan kid who needs an education or you want to improve a classroom in your school. Start off, from, use M Changa, then begin to build on that. As you become more complicated, eh? look at the data, like the data that came from uh, Jadudi. Yeah, how much money were people giving? You see, most people are giving between 200, 500, let's say 40 percent. Yeah, another category that is giving the, the people gave between uh, 501 and 1000 were 31 percent. You begin to look at your data, and again, with things like Google at, uh, Analytics, those begin to help you. But if you are small and you're starting off, some of those things can intimidate you as you become more complex and uh, complex and developed, and you're using now your experience to be able to move ahead, then data becomes a thing to follow. Let me leave it there now, Mia. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Saku and Mike, for the interesting uh, responses. So we have a lot of questions about uh, sharing the presentation. Uh, we are going to share with you an audio video and also the slides that have been presented by both the speakers. So don't worry about that. And now we have someone asking that uh, most of what we have talked about is like health fundraisers, which have that appeal. But now here we have organizations and we have businesses who don't have stories with an appeal. So how best are they supposed to go about storytelling for, this, for their fundraising so that they can also experience the same uh, return uh, on that? So I think uh, one of you can answer this and then we'll have uh, someone else answer the second one. Yeah, so Michael and Sakwa, one of you can uh, respond to the question. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll, Sakwa, Michael, please. Please. <laughs> yeah, I'll, take, I'll, I'll take the one on enterprise. Uh, before taking that, I'll say that um, it's not an issue of health uh, fundraisers. It's an issue of how your story is compelling. I will say for those of us who are in the development sector, there's a time when you could see a photo of a child with mucus and tears coming from Africa, and we believe that's how we could raise money. But right now, for those who are doing any project in this session, we'll tell you clearly, nobody wants to hear that story. What are you doing with our money? How are you accounting for it? What is the change? The same goes, moving away from issues of health, which are more compassionate, you want to, there's that uh, emotional connection you have with them. It goes again to the business. If a business is going to crowdfunding, it's the same way I'm going to do a pitch. And what does a pitch involve, for example? I have to have a clear plan. I have to have a clear budget. I have to have a clear return on investment. I have to have a clear trajectory. What is it that I'm going to gain at the end of the day? If I'm going to make, for example, as I gave an example of um, recyclable or um, bio biodegradable straws, we are talking about plastic everywhere. For example, I'm coming up with a small venture. But I'm in the village as a young man. I want to make briquettes. I want to use cow dung to convert them so that we reduce our our wastage or um, destruction of the forest. It has to be much clear, which SDG am I aligning with around the environment? What is the return on investment? If you give me, for example, 1 million, I'll make two machines. You give me 10 million, I'll make 100 machines. So it, has a, it is about being able to articulate your story all clearly, whether it is a health campaign or a business campaign. For business, it's more shifting towards showing how you're going to break even, how are you going to change that particular business? And I'm saying that because I'll give you an example of Red Cross. Red Cross have a social enterprise arm. If you look at even uh, World Vision, they have a social enterprise arm. Most NGOs are shifting there. They're, they're coming to understand and appreciate the fact that we are moving from the, uh, the basis of operation of the MO of the models of operandi of an NGO to operate as a business. And it has to be very clear. So that, 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 those are my few comments in terms of how we approach crowdfunding as a business. There has to be a model. There's the issue of prototyping. You've tested it and before coming to crowdfund to us, I'll make an example, which is actually funny. In South Africa, there is a company that is raising money to produce, to produce a gin, either gin or rum in South Africa. One of the things they're telling people, if you give us this particular amount of money, you get a discount on a bottle of gin. How do people start contributing to people who are manufacturing alcohol? Number one, you come back to Kenya, there is Ender Sports, as I said earlier. They manufacture sports. They're riding on one thing. We are patriotic. 
We love our athletes. That's one thing we all see. When Kipchoge was running, we all associated with that particular scene, that particular day. And if you're told this is a Kenyan shoe made by a Kenyan lady, I want to be part of that story. So there is also that bit of compelling stories that you want to work with. As much as it's business, I want to work and run with you in that particular direction. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah. Oh, and I okay. think Sakwa has said everything I wanted to say. And uh, I met uh, Kennedy from Enda a few times. He's, he's done presentations in some of the workshops the association has had. And uh, I, I'd, I'll also tie it back to what Sakwa said earlier. You remember he talked about different ways of giving through crowdfunding. So he talked about donations, he talked about reward, equity, debt, peer debt, and so on. And in the case of, uh, again, Enda Shoes, they used a lot of them reward based. Yeah, so they were giving people discounts to buy the shoes in advance, even before they were, they were produced, they used equity. So it gives you an opportunity to, to different, look at different styles. But also there's always a story. And again, uh, Sakwa took the words from my mouth. Yeah, this again, like he says, it's about patriotism. It's about being Kenyan. And if you look at what people say in social media, they say Kenyan, uh, a Kenyan producing sports shoes for Kenyan runners and for the world. This is great. Yeah, CNN carried the story recently. Yeah, but there's always a twist. There's always a thing. And social enterprise has become an acceptable way of being able to have sustainable change. So whether you're looking at dealing with a problem with water, whether it is cheap pharmaceuticals, whether it's cheap animal feeds, and you're talking about exploitation, whether it's trigger feeds, trigger feeds, again, social enterprise, but getting a lot of support. Why? Because we all know our mothers and fathers are exploited by middlemen in the village, that they get very little for their money. Yeah, and people get rich at the expense. So coming down to the story, and we know it, think like a Kenyan. Yeah, always think like a Kenyan. But one other thing I'll quickly say, linked to that, and what I'd said earlier on is, in knowing your target, we tend to give differently. From our experiences in the past, this could have changed. What we know, for example, is Asians will normally give through their groupings, their temples, yeah? Africans, uh, rarely will they give through M-Pesa. Again, this is a change that, uh, a trend that might change in future, but they'll tend to give us groups, we'll tend to make uh, bank deposits, we'll rarely give through M-Pesa, yeah? Europeans will normally use credit card, and if they meet you, for example, in a mall, they'll give you cash, yeah? Africans, we love M-Pesa, we love Airtel, all those things that are related to, to giving a thing that gets into M-Changa. So M-Changa gives you a pay bill, you're able to use that. So knowing how each of your target group gives is important, yeah? Very interestingly, again, coming down to it, I know this is a slight thing, change is, I'll say also from experience, uh, don't assume people, the people you expected to give are the ones who will give. One of the things I used to ask, you know, whenever I would find someone outside, an Uchumi, an Akumat, okay, they've suffered heavily since, or a mall, yeah, that was raising money, and a number of them for some time were sanitary towels. And you'd expect that people would give a more of women. Yeah. In all the six, seven different groups I talked to, the people who gave, yeah, were usually men. Women would blast them and tell them, by the way, Ministry of Education, government is providing sanitary towels. But usually it would be the only elderly men who would give. And their thing ranged from 200 to 500 bob, some 1,000. And then there were Zungus expatriates would come in and give. Yeah, the, I think the thing it tended to range from 1,000 to 2,000 pop. Again, depended on the time of the month that you are looking at. Yeah, the, this relates to the question that was made earlier on data. But just to say, yeah, the story then I'll give a Muzungu is different from the story I'll give an African, might be different from the story I give a rich African vis-a-vis -vis middle class African. Get your story right. Yeah, anything is fundable under the moon. Uh quite interesting and uh, you have pointed a very important key where a uh, point where at all times think about your audience uh, always have an outside eye looking in how will your message be interpreted by them uh, is it suitable for them and all that thank you uh, so we will ask the last question if you have risen your uh, raised your hand please drop your question in the q and a and then uh, we are going to have that answered later on and uh, the last question is, uh, we, we have, can we now just have a summary of this uh, where people are asking, what are these techniques that you, you have mentioned for organization and businesses? So I think Michael, you can give us, uh, Mike can give us two of your top techniques for 
uh, online fundraising and uh, for organizations and businesses and then Sakwa can also give us two and then we can now wrap up this session. So uh, we can start with Mike and then move to Sakwa. Even if I give 200, I'm on the higher side, 500. So we tend to tell. Coming quickly again to our churches. Yeah, when I uh, first started going to church, I remember it was Methodist when I was a small boy. We had the cloth bat. Yeah, give 10 cents uh, shilling in, it was a lot of money. Then you not see what people have given and it was quiet. But these days, if you go into church, it's an open tree and even metallic. So if you put a coin, everyone will know. But we have asked questions why there's already a 1,500 shilling notes yeah, yet you're amongst the, the people on the front seat. It's psychology. Yeah. So when you're looking at the thing, whether it's Mata Hat Run or whether it's any other campaign, start off by talking to your friends to make pledges of certain amounts of money. That will determine how much money people want to put in. If the, 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 the campaign is empty, doesn't matter what uh, platform you use. If M Changa, there's no money there, you'll attract less money through. The second one I'll always say is always write the context in line. We've talked about storytelling, but you need to tell the story that appeals to Mike, yeah? Or appeals to Shah or appeals, because each of us are touched by different stories. We're talking about uh, uh, Jalango. I know again, time is an issue. Remember we said, what if it was Otieno, uh, sorry, Jadudi, what if it was Otieno? Would Kamau have given, yeah? At a time when he had very toxic politics. These are things we need to ask. So when you're writing the story, Tie it out to things out there. Kenyans for Kenyans worked, in my opinion, is because it made us angry. You were angry that government was not helping. We got angrier when chiefs started throwing in people for telling the truth. And we said, we'll show this government that you can work. Yeah? Uh, bring Zach home, I believe, could have raised even more money. But what was wrong with the story? It forgot to tell us that disability can, uh, is anything that can attach, it can affect everyone. Some people are born into it. But other people, like in Zach's case, got it through a gunshot, or uh, there are people get it through accidents. So had that campaign told us that this final injury hospital could save you, uh, save you tomorrow, or could get you out of a wheelchair, more of us would have been given. So that uh, I'll end by saying that story has to be put in context. Sakwa. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. I'll also just give a quickly run through time and say some of the best on top of mind. Um, uh, practice I'll just uh, propose for the team and the audience today is one uh, leverage on existing structure and expertise. What I mean for that, and uh, it will go into simple as using your own phone. We are talking about storytelling, but it comes down to good quality photos, good videos, good pictures. You can, don't have to borrow a camera to do a nice shoot or a nice photo to put there, for example. Because again, when you do a presentation with a lot of wording, people lose time, lose touch with you, they get bored. Use pictures, use graphics when you're telling your story. So Leverage on that expertise, like Mike has said, you don't have to budget for every campaign. My skill could be in writing the budget. Let me write the budget. Get volunteers to work with your campaign. And you'll even notice uh, for the matter hat, which Mike has mentioned, and even, uh, even the stand chat, there are guys who volunteer there. They're taking their expertise there. A moratorium, for example, as a rotary member, we bring in our skills together. People will bring in their skill in financing, and we do projects also for our own end. We fundraise for our own projects, bringing our expertise together without necessarily hiring very high uh, cost or costly stuff to do a project. And then number two is also around developing a common strategy. So it's critical to plan. I'll be honest and tell you, when I did my first crowdfunding in 2017, I thought it's a side thing. You can just go there, put a Facebook post and then continue working. Put a tweet and then continue working. My friends, this is a full-time job. Like Mike said, someone will wake up at the US at 5 p.m. Like right now in the US, it's in the morning. You have to send to them a post at 11 in the US time. Someone is in Australia, how do you post to them, for example, to get the same tweet that you've sent at this particular time in Kenya? So plan critically, let people have roles and functions, and then also have a team leader in running a crowd campaign. Don't be, don't be an isolated uh, tower alone trying to say, I want to do this thing alone. Get a team to work with you. And then the, as I wind up, it's also around impact. Think, of, think around the triple bottom line. 
people, planet, and profit. I'm talking about people in business, for example. Does your campaign bring in people? Is there an element of the planet? That, that is the language we are, that is what is trending currently. People want to listen to what is happening globally and what is affecting them. And then this is very critical again, if you're ever doing a campaign, transparency. Don't raise a million and disappear. Don't raise two million and then become too happy and live alone. The poor gave you money. The world will never forget. They'll come back again. And you saw that story, for example, of the lady who had uh, an issue and then had to raise more money than she needed. Then she ended up buying land, buying a car. That is not what we want. And that one will actually kill the entire spirit of crowdfunding within the context that we're operating in. And then lastly, think about the WIFM effect. W-I-I-F-M effect. What I mean is what's in it for me. Whenever you're doing a campaign and you're going to ask someone to give you something, just think about the WIFM effect. What's in it for me? Thank you so much. It was lovely to have you all. So Naomi, I've uh, just put a comment. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. encourage people, I know we are out of time. Just Google the spring, your charity water. There's a campaign called The Spring, 21 minutes. I mean, it's a beautiful way to tell the story of your organization, campaign and raise money. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Naomi. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And uh, we still have many questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Google Docs with all the questions and then we, uh, Mike and Sako can be able to uh, answer these questions and then we'll have this shared to all the participants so that uh, anyone can be, uh, everyone can be able to get the answers to all the questions that were asked in the session. Uh, other than that, uh, I think we might even have to have you two back to just uh, come back and talk more because you can see that uh, people have really learned a lot. So I can uh, take it back to Michael and then uh, he can wrap up the session for us. Uh, Michael, welcome. Thank you so much, Naomi, for that. Because of time, I'll not take much time. I just want to thank all of you for creating time, coming out of your fixed schedule to come and attend this meeting. We are very much grateful. And thank you for creating time. For Mike and Sakwa, we are very much grateful for accepting to be our guest speakers today. And as you can see, there are many questions. There are people who are asking if you do, if you are doing side mentorship on resource mobilization. So as Naomi have said, we may come back to you again and just to come and we have a, a, a continuation of this topic. So I just want to appreciate all of you. And before I wind it up, Mike, just give us your closing remark, then you pass it to Sakwa, then we'll just write it up at that. Thank you so much. Uh, my closing thing, I, I'm talking especially to the young people out there. The great thing with the modern world is uh, the future of fundraising is online, it's technological, it's social, enter, it's changed. Yeah, so don't worry about people like me who say 30 years experience in fundraising. That era is gone. Yeah, so you've got the opportunity to shape uh, and actually write yeah, the, the new platforms, be it technology, online, uh, social media, storytelling in a way none of us were able to raise. And the great thing is you can uh, compete with the world visions, the, with the action aids, because there are many people even in Europe who will be happy to give you money directly to your wallet. So let me leave it there. Thank you, Mike. Thank you everyone who's listened to us. And thanks. Aqua. For me, I would say, as usual, keep it simple. Keep your campaign simple. Let it have a natural file, fun and also natural uh, life, sorry. And then while well, at it, always have fun. I had fun all through my campaign. I raise money without even knowing. So I think we all, we, we all can do it. Let's have fun while doing it, but at the same time, just also keep it simple and let it have a very natural life as it grows over time. As we all know, once it becomes successful, people will always start coming and want to associate with you. That's one thing I know. I began man with 10 million. By the time I was hitting the 1 million mark, we, have, we had thousands of supporters on board. So it can be done. It can be done. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I must say that we are having a lot of comments. We are going to answer all of this offline. And I just want to wind up by inviting all of you, if you are here and you want to do a, a fundraising, kindly, well, I will invite you to set up an account on, on Mchanga and you'll experience a very, very amazing crowdfunding platform that will be able to meet all your, all your fundraising needs. Thank you so much. And I wish you a great evening and a weekend or a day after tomorrow. Thank you all and bye. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you.